My name is Randy Rubenstein, and welcome to the Mastermind Parenting Podcast. At Mastermind Parenting, we're on a mission to support strong-willed kids and the families that love them. You're listening to the Mastermind Parenting Podcast with Randy Rubenstein, and welcome to today's episode where I have a real treat. I have Daniel Maté. He is an award-winning lyricist. Okay, not going to lie. I had to look up what lyricist meant. <laughs> Songwriter, right? Is, I yeah. mean, okay. Yeah. Word, okay. Word, words guy for songs. Yes, you're. You are. A, but I also write the. But I also write the music, which makes me a composer lyricist. Okay, so a winning a world uh, an award winning lyricist and composer for musical theater. With yeah. his father Gabor Mate, he is the co author of the recently published The Myth of Normal: Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture, and the forthcoming Hello Again: A Fresh Start for Parents and Their Adult Children, based on the popular workshop of the same name. Daniel runs the world's only mental chiropractic chiropractic service where he takes walks with people in person and remotely and helps them get unstuck by aligning their minds. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Ah, I have so much I want to talk to you about that I'm going to have to like channel my inner, harness my inner ADD and, um, and focus on one thing at a time. All right. Um, but I'm just so excited to talk with you, even though your dad has been one of my biggest teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually found him, and so for anyone who has been following me, you've probably heard me mention Gabor over the years. Um, he was, I, I don't know, I think maybe I heard you say this or somebody like he was a little bit of like a cult. He had like a little bit of a, it was, it was almost like a secret cult following. Like he wasn't super mainstream. At least not outside of Canada. In Canada, he was... He was always, you know, he's, he's been well known for a long time, but in the United States, people found out about him through watching him on Democracy Now! back in like 2010 or 2011, and then other, the Tim Ferriss podcast. And so it was like a, he's been a bit of a viral yeah. um, name, you know, until yes. recently. Like I heard you recently say that on the way to one of your workshops, your dad and you got into a fight in the car. On the way to our very first adult child parent workshop where we're going to guide people on how to bring this fractious relationship into the present moment and see each other as you are now and let go of old dynamics, we had one of the most fractious, habitual, unpleasant <laughs> interactions I can remember us ever having. Well, and, and it was interesting because when I've heard you talk about that, um, he said to you, what did he say? I don't like your energy. Yeah, I don't like your energy right now. I don't like the energy that's coming from you. I don't want to deal with this energy. I don't know what was happening for him that day. I know that I was managing like the logistics. I had been looking at the timeline and all that. And we had a disagreement about how long the event should be. And my, you know, and he thought it should only, you know, he asked me what time it was ending. And I said, well, it's ending at nine. He said, that's too long. You know, people aren't going to sit for two hours. I said, what are you talking about? They've purchased tickets. It's a two hour event. And that's where it went from, you know, and I, th my read on that, if I can think back to what was happening is we were renegotiating a power sharing agreement. He had never co-led a workshop before. Mm. He was used to doing Gabor Mate workshops where people come to hear him speak on things on which he is a practiced poised authority yeah where he, when, when he's i mean my dad likes to speak about things he knows are true he's yeah. a truth guy you know yeah. he speaks with great conviction yeah i'm not so into like the because i'm an artist right so i'm all right. about the ambivalence the in between the like this well on the one hand on the other hand you know the tevya thing right uh <laughs> no there is no other hand yeah yeah um further on the route for people who don't know what we're what we're <laughs> Yeah, inside, inside Jewish, Jewish, yeah, <laughs> Jew, Jewish references. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so he was used to being on firm ground, you know, and 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 having the listening of a crowd who really is there to to get life saving information from him. And here we are, we're going to an event where we're going to be both kind of exposed as amateurs, <laughs> to be quite honest. I mean. Certainly, we haven't mastered the territory. We're intrepid explorers. We've gone first and we're mapping it out. But he doesn't know everything there is to know about being a, the parent of an adult child and doing it in the way that's 
that has peace and empowerment in it. He's not an expert on seeing his children as separate beings. He's not an expert on letting go of guilt. He knows that it's there to be let go of, but we're, and, and I'm not an expert on growing out of adolescent dynamics. I'm not an expert on um, seeing myself as separate from my parents. When I was nine years old, I said to my dad outright, I don't know where you end and I begin. Mm -hmm. I can't say that by age 42, when we started doing this, that had totally run its course, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a big, big difference I've been learning in my life. And I think this applies to my dad and I both. Um, it's sort of a dynamic in my family that there's a big difference between being intelligent about emotions and being emotionally intelligent. Mm. Emotional intelligence is in the moment, knowing what's happening for me and being able to separate it from what my perceptions might be and being mm -hmm. able to respond with compassion and a little space and a little grace to it. Mm -hmm. Knowing a lot of stuff about emotions means that I can pull out things like, I don't, I don't like your energy right now. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. projecting. You know, or I know I'm, I need to let go of this thing. That's different than letting go of it. So that's the thing we've both been negotiating is realizing how far we both have to go. And, and, and it's tough. It's, it's, it, it's a more vulnerable thing for him to be up there being shown, even if I'm not doing my little ha ha ha, you guys see what, you know, you, you guys see what he's like, even if I'm not doing that, he's still being shown in the act of trying to to be a parent to an adult child and trying and failing and trying and succeeding. And it's, it's more human and vulnerable than him being up there and telling stories about his parenting from 30 or 40 years ago and all the lessons he's learned and all of the wisdom that he now has to impart. Yeah. So I think there was a nervousness on his part going into it. And there yeah. was an agitation on my part, an insecurity that he wasn't going to let me join him really, that he didn't really want to share mm. the stage with me that I wasn't. And also, but of course, where was that coming from? I don't really think I deserve it. I don't mm. really think I measure up. I think people are only there to see him and all this. So we're both in essence, carrying stories about ourselves and about the other. We're looking at ourselves and the other and the current moment through those stories. We keep finding evidence for how those stories are true. Then we behave in ways that elicit more evidence. And then we're more locked in, more dug in to our position. And we didn't see that until it happened. And we started to see it when we were on stage, I think. It, we, we started debriefing a little bit. And then in the days that followed, we debriefed even more. And that has been part of the dynamic of doing this workshop that by doing it, we get to see ourselves in action and then we can say, Oh, okay. That's what that is. Mm. Well, now we can, now we can tell people about it. Mm. Now we're authorities on it. Mm. We haven't mastered it necessarily. Now we have to practice. How do we have that not happen in the first place or how do we get out of it quicker? But I mean, that's the work, but we're not, we're, we're certainly not, um, well, let me in say some that, kind of paradise of, 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 of reconciliation. No, I think that's what I love. I think that's why I love your dad so much and why I believe him. I also, I'm a truth teller. I would say recently I did a little exercise with my kids, um, and my husband, um, about like, what are your core values? And it really came from like my daughter went on a date. She's 21. And then she was like, it was like, he was interviewing me for marriage. She was like, what are your core values? She was like, um, <laughs> so then we like, we're like, okay, let's go around the dinner table and talk about our core values. And, and so, um, and I realized one of mine is truth. And I feel like your dad is a truth teller. And I think that you guys bringing so much truth to your exchange and sharing the real stories. And, um, I think it's just, it, 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 I just believe, I believe both of you and. Because I'm very sensitive to my dad's tone of voice and mm -hmm. that's a gift and a curse, you know, or at least it's born of a gift and a curse because I have a very acute musical ear, I'm, I'm, but I'm hypersensitive. It's part and parcel of the same thing. And as a child, the tone of my dad's voice, his choice of words, the sound of his very voice, the sound of his footsteps was, was like reading the tea leaves of what was coming. Mm. It was augury. It was, you know, I had to become a real interpreter of the sonic environment and the tonal environment around me for my own survival. I had needed to know what was coming, you know, at least if I could brace myself, you mm -hmm. know, because mm -hmm. there could be rages, there could be, there could be just deep 
sullenness. There could be all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, that can be a place where I can get triggered and then I'm doing the time warp again and I'm back in the past. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, if I'm set in myself and I know what I'm here for and I know that it's not the past, it's now, then I can actually put that to really good use as this collaborator because I can read one sentence and I know, mm, no, you're defaulting to that tone. That's not what we're really saying. Or mm -hmm. there's another way to say this that many more people will get than just the people who are already in your cult. You, you know. accomplish that. You, you definitely and accomplish that. I don't mean that. literal. I don't mean a literal cult, but you know. What I mean. And I yeah. just want to acknowledge you and recognize you for bringing that. You know, I think you bringing your magic is what is helping more people be able to receive the information. I appreciate that. Yeah. No. I and I really mean it. And that. And I, mean, I and I think I agree with you. Like I think yeah. I can even. I, I humbly receive the acknowledgement, but I think I, I think I've been allowing myself to take in that um, that actually I'm not just it's not just a cameo appearance. It's not just you know that I'm a core part of this. And, you really and that, are, yeah. and that it's and that in a way it's a gift to him um, that which as a son makes me feel really good because yeah. his work. I felt from the beginning, this deserves to get out there. This is crucial stuff. And I don't want, and dad, I don't want you to get in the way of you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, and so now I get hired to put words in his mouth and help his, and, and help his message get out to the world. What's not to love. It's awesome. But I also think that, you know, your work, your hello again work is so interesting because even sharing, like not even maybe even more so in sharing on the way to our first workshop, we had one of our biggest blowouts, you know, mm -hmm. not literal, but <laughs> emotional. Right. And, and, and so just the honest, I mean, it does take a ton of vulnerability because that's the thing that most people are so scared about both parents and children, which is sharing what really goes on behind the curtains. Um, I think there's so much shame about what goes on behind yes. the curtains, but yet it's going on behind all of our curtains. Yes. And until, and so it's like a collective shame. Yes. And until we start bringing that out into the light, we're never going to heal it. We're just going to keep continuing this cycle where we're not truly working these things out. We're not figuring out how to have healthier, better relationships with the people we love the most because we're just too scared to even talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, Or and so, yeah. we're too resigned to talk about it. Say we're more about too, that. Well, so this relationship, this adult parent-child relationship, mm -hmm. there's many people who are really frustrated by it and they're actively trying to work on it and they're just, just a, a source of a lot of turmoil and pain. It's a lot of people who are just like, it is what it is, whatever. And the, 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 the thing is, that's totally workable. You actually don't need each other in adulthood anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a parenting coach. You're dealing with a high stakes, time bound, temporary role or function or job parents have, right? And there's a lot that rides on it and nature wants them to accomplish it. Once you both become parents, oh, sorry, once you both become adults, right? there's no blueprint. Right. There's no agenda. How do we want this to go? And most people just settle for the most comfortable default. It's like, okay, maybe I'll see you at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Maybe I'll we'll see you during the summer. Maybe I'll see you every week. Maybe I'll never see you. Maybe we'll never. Maybe you died five years ago. Either way, it all works. Like we can get by. And so that's one aspect of it. If you're going to work on this relationship, it's going to be by choice. And for many of us, we insulate ourselves from the the real headache of working on it by saying whatever it is what it is and so it's gonna it's as good as it's gonna get oh that's just my mom oh that's just my kid now privately yes we may hurt and wince and 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 wonder if it could be different but there's a lot in our culture that tells us oh, it's just a difficult relationship and 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 so um i think us getting on stage yeah, there's the vulnerability in expressing the shame. I mean, for me, quite honestly, when people commend us for our vulnerability and courage, 
it's not such a vulnerable thing for either my dad and I to get up there and talk about difficult stuff. I think we both have a kind of performative, like, look mm. at how candid we can be kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of, I'm not saying it's inauthentic, but that's not the vulnerable thing. The vulnerable thing is to actually have moments on stage where it happens mm. and have people see the cracks in our armor. Mm. Like the vulnerable thing for me was in the last workshop we did, something happened between us on stage where I thought an agreement got violated, trust got violated. The, there was a breakdown in collaboration, basically. And I got so triggered. Was it when he was looking at his email? No, that wasn't. Yeah. It was. It was later that weekend. That didn't. Okay. That actually didn't bug me so much. Mm -hmm. It just. I just thought that was funny. You know, I kind of. I, I, I liked that you called him because I noticed he was doing it. Yeah. And I loved. That's what I'm talking about. That like like even sure. just that you like were like you did something. You know. Well, but so but talking about vulnerability, right? Yeah. So I think I saw him go through different stages of vulnerability. In one moment, I said. Dad, are you sending an email? He said, it's okay, Daniel. It's okay. I said, I know it's okay, but are you sending an email? Yeah, I had to, whatever. He, so it gives me the sort of, yeah, the explanation. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I'm just going to continue with my speech that I was giving because I'm not going to get derailed by this. That was my approach. Yeah. And then later I asked him about it and he, I can't remember what he said, but then later in the evening, we did, we haven't posted the Q and A online, but someone said to him, so Gabor, like, I saw you go into father mode when, when, when Daniel asked you, but you're like trying to reassure your son that it's okay. And my dad said, you know what the truth is? And it took him like an hour and a half and someone else, not me asking him the question to admit this. He said, I wasn't going into father mode. I was going into scared, guilty child mode. Mm -hmm. Daniel caught me with my hands in the cookie drawer. Mm -hmm. I absolutely should not have been sending, checking my email during that. And I got sucked into my old role as the workaholic doctor. And then I was justifying it and, 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 and sort of, you know, stonewalling the investigation, being like, no, it's I, mm -hmm. it's not, no big deal. So that was, to me, that was vulnerable. Like admitting, mm -hmm. because my dad and I are both smarty pants. We both know a lot of stuff. Like I said, we're intelligent about our emotions. But emotional intelligence is the ability to like relax into what's actually happening and just tell the simple truth. And just like me on stage, when I get riled up, I'll get clever and I'll get kind of snipey and I can get some people in the audience on my side and some people in the audience will think I'm a brat. If you read the YouTube comments, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. I really don't like Daniel. He gives me good, he gives me bad vibes. Daniel's so amazing. He's so authentic, whatever. It's all, You're right. <laughs> it's, you know, like it, it, it's a roulette wheel of reactions and everyone's right. Um, but the vulnerable thing was me later that weekend when I felt when I quote unquote felt betrayed, which is to say I felt scared, ashamed, nervous, and angry and had a story in my head that he's betraying me, which is a familiar story. Mm -hmm. I said to him, dad, I'm going to step outside. You take it for a while. Mm. It wouldn't be responsible for me to continue on right now. Everyone can see that I'm triggered. I'm not going to lead from this place. Mm. You go ahead. That was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. because I had to, I had to stop pretending that I could handle it and that I could overcome it and that I could lead my way through it. And I had to give up my coping mechanism, which is like, oh, dad, I'm going to beat you at your own game. Mm -hmm. I've been mm -hmm. competing with him my whole damn life. I'm too good at it. It exacts, it exacts a huge cost on me. It's mm -hmm. exhausting. It never actually leaves me feeling free. It keeps him in that role. Mm -hmm. It keeps him on the defensive. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's the vulnerable thing mm -hmm. is, is not showing off for the crowd because mm. the voice in my head was screaming at me. Don't do that. Don't be, be a professional, suck it up, either fight mm. with your dad or just shut up and just stick with it. These people, these people came here for something. You're going to abandon them. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yeah, I don't have anything to give them right now. I'm going to take like a emotional bathroom break. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> so I need, like, right. Like I need to just go and calm my body down and I'm going to like, that's self care. I mean, it is. And it's, and it's recognizing that, look, if I'm here to give people something, what is it? It's clarity. It's like crystal clarity. That's what I love seeing in people. Hmm. It's seeing things clearly. It's facing reality the way it is. It's freedom from all these familiar stories. It's something new. It's a fresh look. 
I cannot give that to them authentically if I'm not giving it to myself, if I'm not present to it myself, if I'm not generating it sustainably within myself and insisting that I get it first. Like if I'm not putting my oxygen mask on first, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be reaching to give it to them and I'm going <laughs> to collapse, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I've seen my dad do this way too often as a workaholic, important, life-saving physician who's traveling all over the world but isn't taking care of himself, I've learned by negative example, and I've learned from my own negative example, that ultimately the kind of giving I want to do, the kind of contribution I want to do is one where I'm contributing from a renewable wellspring in myself so that I get some of it too. And if, and that means that if I have a pretty high capacity for being on there with him and being a little stressed out and working through it and navigating it, in the moment and, and being playful or whatever. But if it gets to the point where I'm starting to dissociate, mm -hmm. I'm having like a full blown trauma response, which is what was happening. It's time mm -hmm. for me to step off and it's mm -hmm. not his fault either. I can be angry at him, but it's not his fault. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. my responsibility. And when I came back, the room was transformed actually. And people asked me questions about it and we didn't need to do a big debrief because I had realized everything I needed to realize outside that room. And then people learned a lot from what I said about what it took for me to be conscious enough in that moment to step outside. What was, so this is an, this to me is what most parents struggle with. Okay. Or when they have a little kid that is triggering them in some, you know, the kid's behavior is triggering a response within them mm -hmm. and noticing here's this response. I cannot be in my thinking brain right now. And so yeah. I have to remove myself from the situation and go put on my own oxygen mask and calm myself down so that I can come back and handle this situation because right now it's just two toddlers, right? Like if I respond right now, it literally is just me being, you know, a toddler in grown up skin. And so that moment of mindfulness that you modeled there, what does it look like for you to be able to, to do that, to take mm -hmm. yourself, you know, to bring your conscious brain into it? Absolutely. It's funny when you're describing a parent doing that, it makes me realize that the whole timeout thing is just ass backwards. You give right. yourself a time, give yourself a timeout. That's right. That's <laughs> you're right. The one, you're the one who needs the timeout. Right. The, ki the kid's doing just fine. <laughs> you know? Well, it's, ex um, it's exactly what you said when, when y'all were, you know, just, and I want you to, to give your answer here about your mindfulness yeah. strategy in that moment, when you guys got into the argument in the car and you said, I was feeling anxious. I was feeling all these things. And that's exactly right. Like when our kids show up in ways that trigger us, the truth yeah. of them, what's underneath their behavior is always anxiety, um, some, you know, fear. There's something going on for them. And so we have to be able to get, go away from the moment so we can come back and truly help the other person yeah. um, or help the child because the child doesn't, is, doesn't have the capacity to help themselves. So they need right. us as their adult in that moment. So what is your strategy? Well, I wouldn't call it a strategy, but that's only because I'm a stickler for words. Okay. Um, um, I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a habit. It's a practice. It's a, an approach. Maybe we can call it an approach. Okay. Strategy is very outcome oriented. I find strategies to be kind of like, you know, you, you have the huddle on the side of the football field. You're going to go out and do this strategy, but then maybe the other team does something totally different. You can't implement that. Right. right. But anyway, that, that, that aside. Well, it, it, there's a few components to it. Let me see if I can break this down. I don't have a prepared answer for this. It's okay. Yeah. So number one, there's a backlog of experience. This has happened before. This is familiar. I have to get a certain distaste for the familiar. I have to become aware that the familiar will always want to come back. And I have to ask myself, how willing am I to tolerate the same shitty experience over and over again? Like, do I need that, that thing to happen the same way again for me to learn from it? Or has it happened enough times for me to actually take a step forward in it? And I need to ask myself this before we get on stage together. Mm. And in fact, my dad and I set the intention for the weekend of good vibes. 
you know, your listening audience can't hear it, hear it, but I've got my good vibes only mm -hmm. uh, bug right here. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the heuristic. It's like, we're going to make this important as opposed to like, we're going to just let it all hang out and show people how honest we are or whatever. No, we're going to try and just have a good time and enjoy each other. So we made, that's called an intention. We made something more important than the default drift of habit. Mm -hmm. We found something that we could both feel strongly about, that we both actively wanted, that we could generate in the crunch when things get off course. We can say, okay, wait a minute, we're drifting off into that other realm, but that's not aligned with what our intention is. Our intention is good vibes. That's okay, so let me it. just pause and, and break that down for the listener. So you set an intention so you have something to anchor yourself to. Yes. Right. So it was good vibes. We're going to get up there and we're going to, you know, we're going to be in connection with each other. We're going to make that a, important. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to be a positive. It's going to be, you know, a good vibes. It's going to be something positive for us. And we're, yeah. yeah. Okay. We're both going to feel safe. We're both going to feel trusted. We're going to both be feeling. And, and if we're not, then that's what there is to deal with. What do I need to ship so that I can get back into that space? Right. So it, it rather than this fallacy of 50, 50, because if you want relationships to be miserable, make them relationships are 50, 50. It's a two way street. A hundred, it's not a really, a, it's not really right. a two way street. It's like a pedestrian. It's a free for all. It's going in every, so it's a hundred, a hundred, which really in practice means a hundred because the yeah. other person's hundred is none of your business. Right. I love that. Yeah, you know? So I went into it with that attitude for myself. So even if my dad drops the ball on our intention, I'm a hundred percent responsible for my intention, which is to be Good true vibes. to this. Yeah. Good vibes, true to this. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to overlook or deny or, or, or um, make excuses for moments that where things get intolerable. Intolerance is, you know, tolerating is different than accepting. You know, you can accept what's happening which is spiritually intelligent, but to tolerate things drifting further and further from your intention, you're just asking for more of it. And essentially you're just pushing away the, the explosion. You're pushing away the conflict. So that's not what good vibes are about. Good vibes are like, no, the, there's a space that we love to inhabit up here. And if we're drifting away from it, let's put a focus on what does it take to get back rather than trying to like litigate it through the audience or try to win or try to, you know, or just try to ignore it. So I had that going into it and I did have a backlog of experiences knowing that sometimes when I'm on stage with my dad, especially when he's tired, especially when he's on, he's been on tour and our event comes in the middle of, or at the tail end of talk after talk, after workshop, mm -hmm. after conference, after keynote, after interview, after podcast, he can go into automatic pilot mode. Mm -hmm. He is after all a 78 year old man. Mm -hmm. And anyone can go into automatic pilot mode, but you know, old dogs, new tricks. I mean, I have to make allowances for the fact that my dad is who my dad is mm -hmm. and his bandwidth is limited and he's got an incredible bandwidth compared to most people. I don't know how he does it. I, I don't wouldn't either. Be able to keep up, I wouldn't be able to keep up his schedule. Me but by neither. the time, but by the time he gets, so I have to make allowances for that. I have to make allowances for the fact that I know that this is a challenging topic for him and that sometimes he just wants to get through it and that yeah. sometimes he'll just default to whatever works for him in his other workshops. Hmm. And so sometimes he'll just try to take over from me. Mm -hmm. If, if we're not in good communication, if time is short. And I know from past experience that that often feels to me like a total, again, I interpret it as a betrayal. It taps into one of my deepest wounds, which is disloyalty, which is that anything is more important than me or than his family, that looking good to the public is more important. Now he's talked about this dynamic, right? I'm not talking out of school here, the workaholic thing. But for me over here, it's the story. I'm not important. You, I don't matter to you. And the minute I'm inconvenient to you, you will throw me under the bus. Mm -hmm. Now that is a story, but it's connected to a whole bunch of feelings and emotions of abandonment, of sadness, of hurt, indignation, upset, um, a kind of sense of being bereft, like despair, 
It's all in there and it's just waiting to come out the minute something like this happens. So I have to know that I'm carrying a powder keg. You know, we talk, my dad and I often talk about uh, in the book, uh, the, the, the idea of being triggered. Well, the trigger is the smallest part of any weapon. The, the payload, the gunpowder, the delivery system, the safety, the guidance system, all that, that's what we need to pay attention to. And that's ours. So I, I have to be aware that I'm carrying that and handle that with care. And then um, I have to also know what my limits are. I have to be tapped in enough to my body to be like, okay, I can handle this much stress up here. Some stress is productive. And once it gets past a certain threshold, I have to have an override system that says, okay, stop. Stop trying to fix this. Stop trying to solve this problem because you are past the point of being able to solve anything. You're now thinking with your survival brain. Mm. You know, your dorsal vagal nerve or whatever the hell it is, is going into <laughs> overdrive and, 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 you, and I can feel it. So I, I've had enough experiences to know. It's funny about, you ask about mindfulness. We once had this incident, one of the incidents actually that, that got lodged in my brain as in a moment where I perceived betrayal and where I had to draw a line was someone asked us in Toronto at one of our workshops, someone said to him, Gabor, what's it like to have a son who doesn't practice mindfulness? Because you're so mindful. You know, you're like the king of mindfulness, I think he said. Like you teach mindfulness. You've given so many of us so much insight into mindfulness. What's it like to have a son who's so impetuous and flies off the handle and so is so reactive? And my dad actually said, well, you know, I've learned that when we have expectations of our children, we're only going to get disappointed. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's my work to do. If I'm disappointed, if I have judgments about it, I'm standing there like, I don't believe this. And I said, may I say something, please? And he said, sure, of course. And I said, number one, uh, my mindfulness is none of your business. Hmm. And I really dislike in this family how we think we, how we use psycho-spiritual language to assess and judge other people and use it as a cudgel, as a way of warding off other people's critiques or complaints. Well, you're triggered. Well, I don't like your energy. Well, who are you being right now? And we just, we quote Eckhart Tolle or Landmark or whatever it is we've done. And yep. we just, we throw at each other like darts. It's horrible. Yeah. And I, and I've done it too, but I basically said to him like, no, that's foul. That's foul ball. That's, I blew the whistle. Okay. Number one. So you are not an authority to speak about my mindfulness. That's my hundred. Mm -hmm. You don't get to comment on it. Right. All right. When you do that, how mindful are you being? Number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you have no idea how much mindfulness it takes for me to be up here at all. Right. You don't see all the things I'm not, all the facial expressions I'm not making. You don't hear all the barbs that don't come out of my mouth. And if you sense tension in me, that's the tension of being someone who's not a spiritual master, who's doing his best to filter through, remember, what is my intention? What am I up here for? What are these people here for? What are you and I here for? And trying to align my behavior and my reactions and sort through my thoughts and feelings in real time and to collaborate with you and all that. So if you actually knew what mindfulness it takes me to be up here, I think you would have responded to that differently. And I just left it at that. And a lot of the adult children in the room gave me some applause and a lot of the parents looked kind of uncomfortable. But so that was a moment where I actually, because I hadn't realized that for myself before, that, wow, this is hard work. This is cross training and I'm doing it. So I'm not going to let this voice in my head be like, oh, if you, if you get angry, you're not mindful. No. How quickly do I notice it? How acutely do I feel exactly. it in my body? How, how soon do I let down my sword and shield of like trying to attack or defend and just be like, okay, what do I need? So I've learned from our interactions, what doesn't work and what I really dislike. And I've really felt the pain of it afterwards. And I've let myself get really sad about it. I've let myself get really angry about it. And I said to him after that incident in Toronto, I said, I, I will walk away from this work with you. I'm not threatening you, but I just want you to know this is not an at all costs thing for me. And I need certain things when I collaborate with people. I expect certain things. Well, can I just pause for a second yeah. and kind of unpack some of the things that of you course. just said? Yeah, yeah. 
So when my daughter was asked about what her core values are, <laughs> but you know, and, and she was like, um, humana, humana, humana. And she's like, I, I don't know that I really think about it. I think I just live by them. Hmm. And, and, and he said, well, if you had to name them, what would they be? And she thought, and she thought, and she said, honesty, kindness, and confidence. I think confidence. It was something that represented that she wasn't a doormat, right? And, um, and she's like, I think I just live by it. Like, that's just how I live it. So I think it's interesting with all this psycho-spiritual babble you know, we need language. You know, you're a wordsmith. You know, you understand the power of words, right? I love yeah. how you kind of talked about strategy. Um, we need language to start understanding something. But the true mastery comes from not just talking about it, but actually just living it. 100%. Right? When you and master so, it, it disappears. Right. You don't, you don't see the technique anymore when Wayne Gretzky... I mean, he's put in all the, or Michael Jordan or whoever, they've put in the hours or, 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 or Liza Minnelli, you know, anyone in any domain who's mastered something, the well, practice has, is in the past. The technique has been absorbed into them and now they're just living it. Well, that's my point is yeah, it's sort of like, you know, your dad, he's really been such a thought leader with so many things that, you know, now people are, are really starting to 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 look at and 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 it makes a lot of sense and and i and he's a, i mean i get it your parents made mistakes they were human being humans messy blah 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 but at the end of the day you guys are a family mm -hmm. that at this point in time like you're talking about a lot of the things that most parents and their adult children are not talking about that's yes. what i would assert yes and so you are sort of like 2.0. Okay. You're 2.0. You're the product of that. So it's like, I don't need to, to talk about or prove to any of you people that I'm living in a mindful way. I'm just yeah. living it. Yeah. And so, so the thing that I think you did on that stage was you set the attention intention ahead of time. But then you actually notice the sensations you were having in your body, mm -hmm. right? And I think for many of us, we we turn those sensations off long ago because yeah. because that's what happens, you know, yeah. whatever. And when kids are shut down, you learn it's not safe to feel the things. Yes. So, so you felt the actual sensation in your body and you mm -hmm. listen to that sensation. And when you listen to that sens sensation and you acknowledged it, you were able to sort of move up temporarily in your brain to identify that this, something's coming up for me. Something's coming up for me. I'm not able to be here and stay true to the intention I set ahead of time. And then you, and then you actually disengaged and removed yourself from the situation and went and took care of yourself. Is that? Yes. It, it, it that that's very close to it. And it's probably completely accurate. I do have to say, I don't consider myself the most somatically intelligent person in the world in terms of body awareness. When everyone asks me, where do you feel that in your body? I can't really answer that question often. But I, I am finding, and this is why I'm excited about this mental chiropractic thing that I made up and that I do with people, many more people than I used to now that the book is out. And I'm, I'd like to write, write a book about it myself. And I'd like to train other people to be able to do it because I think it's pretty cool. I think the mind gets a bad rap in psycho-spiritual circles. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to just like being mindful means just watching the mind. You know, just watch the thoughts. You know, the Eckhart Tolle, <laughs> you know, no, the mind is... Uh, <laughs> And just let it drift by and just, you know, don't get involved in the content. I think there is a way to harness the awareness about what's going on in the mind. So for me, what actually happened on that stage is I noticed that I was having certain kinds of thoughts. Mm. If you can be aware that you're thinking, I noticed 
And I, and not only that, I noticed that I was having certain kinds of sense impressions that the mm -hmm. world, that the light felt a certain way, that the room looked a certain way, that the people out there in the audience started occurring to me like enemies, like a hostile crowd mm. that my thoughts were starting to race. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. From there I can be like, oh, well. How do I actually feel? Well, from, from once I notice that, mm -hmm. it's like once I notice I'm having a nightmare, mm -hmm. then I can feel my racing chest. Mm. So that for me is like my first, that's my way okay. into my body is to say it's phenomenological. It's like, what am I experiencing? I'm experiencing life as if. Mm -hmm. And my dad often says, that's not a feeling. If someone says, he says, how are you feeling? I'm feeling betrayed. He's like, that's not a feeling. Well, that's true. But if you say, I'm feeling as if I'm being betrayed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm in a nightmare where I'm being betrayed. Well, what mm -hmm. does that feel like? That's a whole world. That's a whole psychedelic experience. And the fact is we're having psychedelic experiences all the time. We're doing the time warp. We're reliving things. Now, what was I reliving up on that stage? Well, my dad's told the story a million times on a million podcasts. I'm three years old. I don't want to sing happy birthday to him. It's his birthday. We're at my grandparents' house with the whole extended family. When my dad tells the story, he says, well, Daniel's just being a normal three-year-old. I think to myself, no, I was being a normal three-year-old who was probably angry at you for some very valid reason, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. some chronic reason. So it wasn't just that day. Mm -hmm. I was being a, a three-year-old who is starting to realize I don't want to be told what to do by my dad all the time. And I don't want to perform love and honor of my parents. I want to have the real thing. So if I don't feel like it, I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. But whatever was going on for me, I didn't want to sing happy birthday. He said, yes, you're going to sing happy birthday to me or you're not going to get cake. Mm. And I bet he thought he was, you know, training me in good social, pro-social behavior or something. I bet that, you know, or maybe he just didn't think. Maybe he was just off to the races. But a few minutes, a few seconds later, he slapped me across the face, smacked me like, I don't know if it was backhand or forehand, but I got taken home. I got taken out of there almost, you know, in shame, really. Now, of course, my mom was taking me out of there to get me out of a tough situation. And then I got cake later. I got apology and I got to call the entire family the next morning and be like, Daddy apologized. I didn't have to sing happy birthday. So that was my little consolation prize. But that's cold comfort. Hmm. So that's the nightmare I was reliving. This is my dad's show. And I'm here to pay honor to him. And he gets to call the shots. And if I want to do things my way, even if I have a totally legitimate reason, and in this case, the thing we were arguing about was timing schedule. We had a certain amount of time left in the program and we had agreed on a certain timeline and he wanted to kind of change it ad hoc. And he had been late for the session that morning. So time, I was like, it's not my fault. We're running out of time, you know? So we're now we're into this. So that's what I was reliving. That's what I was, I was, I was reliving as if I was in that reality. So that was my end being like, this reminds me of, this reminds me of now, some people will get that by, oh, my heart's racing. Some people will get it like, oh my God, the room, the, the room is going black. Oh my God. I can't feel my legs. There's another piece I need to, I need to mention because this is very important. I told you what had me go out of the room. I didn't tell you what had me come back into the room. Mm. And that was the most breakthrough part of it for me. It really surprised me. See, I thought I was just going to have to go out there and let go of my anger and get grounded again and just, you know, forgive him or just, you know, psych myself up to come back and do the last half an hour and then we'll have a big fight about it later. That was the best case scenario. That was my working theory as to like the best way it was going to play out. And that's not very inspiring because I've done that before. Right. So even in the scenario where that works out, part of me is just like, fuck, like, I don't want to do this again. Right. Right. A participant came out to check on me. Hmm. And I was embarrassed at first because I'm supposed to be the workshop leader. Like, no, 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 no. Let's not roll reverse. You don't have to take care of me. He said, I just, you know, I just wanted to see it. I said, I'm all right. I'm all right. And he just stood there. He just stood there. And he like, without saying he was holding space, he held space. And then I said, no, I'll be all right. It's just this and this, that. And I just, I had a chance to like verbalize some of it. And I wasn't ranting, but I was expressing my frustration and how this always happens. And I can always count on something like this happening and so on and so forth. And what was interesting was that the part of the workshop that, that he was fast tracking us through that I was trying to do is the piece about architecture, 
where we try to give people a chance to plan new structures in their relationship for how to have new things happen and have old things not have to happen. So new habits, new practices, new times of day when you speak. There's architecture in any relationship that keeps habits going. Just like to any addiction, there's architecture. You know, I go to this part of town and that's yeah. where I get this triggered. I talk to this person, I watch this program, you know, everything has a structure, a hidden structure. And if we're not creating a conscious structure, then the default structure will suck us back into the past that's already there from habit. And he said to me, this guy, the, the participant said, sounds like you guys are missing some architecture about how to deliver the architecture piece. And the room, the, 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 the sky brightened and I was like, oh my God, you're right. And my whole body relaxed because I realized, oh, it's not even that he did any, I mean, yes, he did the thing, whatever. He did that thing. That's what he does. And I did the thing I do, but we didn't set ourselves up to succeed here. It's a blind spot. We didn't put in, because we always run out of time with this piece. We never get to finish it. We always have to fast, even when we have four more hours of the workshop than we did this time, which was sort of a, a compressed timeline. So I realized, oh, it's structural. We haven't made it. And that means that this is the piece of the workshop where, that we're the least conversant in, that we're the most nervous about, that we're the most insecure about. So we haven't put in the time to like, we just, there's just a piece missing in our training. And I went back in the room and I shared that and it, and my dad seemed to appreciate that too. And, you know, on Monday we have a zoom call planned and we're going to take a good hour and a half because we're leading the workshop again next weekend in Vancouver. So before I fly to Vancouver, we're going to take a good hour and a half and we're going to retool the second or the, the fourth quarter basically of, of the, of the workshop so that it's really in our wheelhouse so that we know what we're doing and we feel as excited about it as the other parts, because this part clearly, we just didn't know what to do with it. So when we don't know what to do with something, when we don't have a conscious structure, we default to our coping patterns, our survival mechanisms, the power struggle, the stories, all of that. So that for me was the ultimate liberation. It wasn't even personal. It wasn't even interpersonal. It was environmental. It was structural and real responsibility looks like let's address the context that we're operating in because we can only do as well as the context allows. So rather than focusing on the content and retooling the content and litigating this and who, yeah, we can change our behaviors and our intentions, but the more global we can get and say, Hey, this relationship happens under certain conditions. What conditions seem to promote it going well? And what conditions seem to promote it going the way we always predict it will? That was a real breakthrough for me. That was really exciting. And I'm excited to see what happens next week. Well, and it's interesting because, and the way I would have, I would take that experience and use it in the future. If you're interested in hearing, yeah, I would name the trigger. That's, I mean, it's like three-year-old birthday, you know, Yep. dad's birthday party. That's yep. my third, that's my, my any, cause, cause, cause that was a real, you know, that was a real trauma for you. Right. Yes, and so it's deeply embedded in your brain. And so it's going to continue to come up, even though the situation's totally different to your brain, something about it feels very similar. So like, oh, that's my three-year-old birthday trigger. And, oh, it's structural. It's the architecture thing. So like I would have a mantra so that when you're in the three-year-old birthday trigger, you can remind yourself, this might just be a structural thing because that That's takes you from the past to the present. And mm -hmm. there's a mindful, you know, there's a mindfulness strategy because we, you know, that's what mindfulness is, is just a way to be able to actually manage our minds and work yes. with ourselves 100%. in this moment, in this yeah. present moment. Yeah, so, that's right. And and I think also in, in addition to that, like sort of a yes and to that, mm -hmm. the more the more victories we have in the present, the more we get a taste for victory. So right. then when when things start going south, we're like it doesn't have to be this way. This is weird. Right. Like when we started this workshop, things going south was the norm. That's what we expected. If we could get one hour on stage together with good vibes, that would be an accomplishment. So right. that was our, that was our myth of normal, you know, in our relationship. But when you get unused to that, when you dis accustom yourself 
to the stress and you start creating structures that work. So if we solve this structural thing, for instance, create a new piece of architecture that allows that last quarter of the workshop to really stick the landing. And I'm not saying we haven't done a good job with the workshop. People get a lot out of it, but to our satisfaction, we haven't, it just hasn't been quite as rich at the end. So if we can find a way to like, do it so that we don't have to manage the time because the workshop flows all the way through, not just the first few days when we're talking about trauma and all the difficulties, which is, which is, that's our comfort zone. We like talking about that stuff, but the mm -hmm. solutions, well, we don't know, but if we can get to the place where the, the workshop is handled and we can do that a few times, it starts to change the baseline reality where the baseline reality is it's weird if we're at odds with each other on stage. So there must be something wrong, right? Like, you're not the guy who wants to betray me and I'm not the guy who wants to undermine you. And we know that. So like, what happened? Did someone. Is well, someone bringing that, you're bringing the curiosity to it. And then, That's I right. mean, then right. You're setting like, yourself up to succeed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know our, our time has come to an end and mm. I, I know, cause you have something and I have something, but I could talk to you all day. And we didn't even, we didn't even touch upon the fact that both of our dads were or are, my dad's still alive too, Hungarian Jews. Hmm. Um, my dad is a year younger than your dad. His birthday is May 25th, 1946. Hmm. And he was born in a deported persons camp and both of his parents were Holocaust survivors. That might be my uncle's birthday actually, May 25th, now that I think about it. Really? My, my dad's brother, yeah, I'll have to check. Um, yeah, they were born in a deported persons camp in Germany. Wow. He was, he was born there. And um, and and unlike your dad, my dad is the version of trauma that never processed the trauma. Yeah. So um, so that uh, that is going to be a conversation I would love to have with you in the future, because let's do a part two. Because I don't even understand. You know, I, I really want to just. You know, I sort of want you to share parts of your experience or even to coach me a little bit on mm -hmm. understanding that because these are just like family secrets that, you know, other than my grandmother's hidden Shoah interviews that she did with that Steven Spielberg project, other wow. than those, which we only uncovered about eight years ago, eight or 10 years wow. ago, um, we know nothing. We mm. like, we know essentially nothing. And, mm. um, and so, so yeah. if you were to ask me for coaching, what would it be on? I don't know. I, I, I think it's, uh, I think I just want to understand. I don't know. I think I just want to understand it on a deeper level. You know, I think it's, I also grew up with, you know, there was a lot of rage. I mean, you know, unprocessed trauma shows yeah. up in the form of rage when you're the parent. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so there was a lot of rage. Um, I, I am in relationship with my dad, my, you know, so it's not like, a, a, it's not an estranged relationship, but I think it's like, when you know, this is a deeply traumatized person and, um, and you are in relationship with them and they are not, it's their business, right? It's exactly yeah. what you said about the other thing. And he is not interested in processing or or doing any work in that area. Um, yep. And so it's like as the adult child, yeah. just kind of making peace with that and maybe even finding more compassion for that. Yeah, well, there, the, I, I hear you. It sounds like there's something in the way of you fully being able to embrace him the way he is because there's still a part of you that's holding out for the part of him, for, for the version of him that should have been even yes. the, ver even, even the Holocaust traumatized version of him. There's a, there's a better version of that one that, that somehow fell off the supply line and you got this one. Yeah. It might be that I'm, li I live vicariously through. I think that's been part of the fascination. I've even sent him things uh, by your dad before because I thought, because I thought, you yeah. know, maybe he'll listen to this guy. You know, they're like the same age and the same background. Yeah. Um, and Good your dad's, you know, and your dad's so smart. Yeah, he never listened to anything. But I think maybe it's, yeah, like. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, what I'll say to this is we could do that on your podcast. But I would also say if you really want to take that on and have a shift in your view of it that's more than intellectual, but actually where you can see it in a new way that you can't unsee, take a walk with me.
Yeah. That's exactly the kind of, because that's a kind of stuck point of view. You know, there's a better point of view out there. You just can't access it right now. That's right. And That's this right. one is so airtight. It makes so much sense to you. It doesn't align with your inner values, clearly, speaking of that exercise that your daughter, because something is bothering you about it. So something yeah. is misaligned. And there's a reason I call it mental chiropractic, because I want to take the spine of your mind, find out, first of all, what's the vertebrae of intention? Mm-hmm. What's the spinal cord of intention? Because that is really the core. That's the center. That's the alignment principle. And then how do we align the values, the thoughts, the perceptions, the stories, the the memories, the, all of that with that intention so that you're living true to that and then your system can relax and then you can be at your very, very best with the person who's actually there. So that would be a very rich conversation that we would do while, while walking, you in yeah. Houston, me in, me in Brooklyn. Yeah, I just got completely calm and centered and grounded in my body as you were describing that. So I know oh, that wow. that's... That is what I want to do. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> that like, it's like an infomercial. I know. No, I mean. What would you say, Randy, if you knew that you could take a, a <laughs> that walk? you could take a walk with me. <laughs> um, How does okay. that feel in your body? Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a great conversation and yeah. I look forward to being in touch. Yeah. Really fun speaking with you. Thanks for this. Yeah. Thanks for listening today, guys. I hope you picked up some tips, tools, maybe some baby steps for creating more balance and boundaries in your life. And I just wanted to let you know, if you want to continue moving the needle forward in creating this for yourself, having a happier household, I want you to go to my website and check out mastermindparenting.com. We have three beginning programs. And if you need some accountability and more support, then please look for the one that would be a good fit for you. Um, And as always, we're on all the social channels under Mastermind Parenting. On Instagram, it's Mastermind underscore Parenting. Um, And, you know, periodically I do pop up on different Instagram lives, Facebook lives, where I give you teaching and coaching, and I love engaging with you live to help you help your strong-willed kids so that they can feel better because when they feel better, they do better. And um, I love, love, love getting to know you guys. So thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Super, super appreciative.